Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Grand Tactician The Civil War, a early access Civil War strategy and war game that allows you to play through the American Civil War as either the Confederacy or the Union, with total control of the strategic picture of raising armies and training troops and picking policies, while also enabling you to fight tactical battles when various armies meet. We are playing, I think this is episode number 10 of our Let's Play series, playing as the Union in this series. And we've taken Richmond early in the war. It's August of 1861. We've already taken Richmond. But the force that took Richmond is the Department of Pennsylvania under General Patterson. And they lost a battle moving east against Yorktown. There were 24,000 Confederate troops who had previously been the defenders at Richmond. And they had withdrawn to Yorktown. And I was trying to catch him between Fortress Monroe and... Um, sort of the, the western edge of the peninsula, except they defeated me, and so I withdrew to Richmond. Well, it turns out that Confederate army of 24,000 men under PGT Beauregard has advanced and are attempting to retake Richmond for the Confederacy. Obviously, Richmond being the Confederate capital, it's a pretty important thing. With that being said, uh, my troops, because of their defeat, have low morale. Four of my brigades, about 5,000 men, a little bit less than half of my troops, have low morale, which means they will not be effective fighters. In fact, our cavalry brigade was destroyed in the last battle. And so with that being said, I'm going to order this force to try and withdraw in good order. And then my plan is to bring the main field army in the Eastern Theater, the Army of Northeastern Virginia, with about 20,000 soldiers under Major General Irvin McDowell, and bring them down to prevent Richmond from being retaken by the Confederates. So that's going to be my strategy. We're going to withdraw the Department of Pennsylvania. We're going to allow them to rest and regroup. We'll probably shift them west to guard the exit of the southern end of the Shenandoah Valley, and then we'll advance into the heart of Virginia, south of Richmond, with the Army of Northeastern Virginia, which was always intended to be the main field army, and through quirk of circumstances and getting tied up near Fredericksburg, um, they did not end up fighting the Battle of Richmond because the Department of Pennsylvania came down the valley and then flanked east toward Richmond in a what I would consider a brilliant maneuver, or I'm sure historians in this alternate history would consider a brilliant maneuver, but that's neither here nor there. So we're going to go ahead and order Major General Patterson to withdraw, and we'll see what he's able to do. Meanwhile, we're also going to go ahead and order the Army of Northeastern Virginia to go ahead and move toward Richmond. They are low on food, but I think their food stocks are adequate. They're at about 36%. I think they just started drawing more provisions as they got close to this depot near Fredericksburg. Now I'm going to order them to move toward uh, Richmond. It also just said a unit routed, so I don't know really how the withdrawals work other than you take casualties and rear guard actions. So you can see here we're losing troops steadily. Not a ton, but 15 here or there. And I'm going to go ahead and have them fall back. I guess I can't tell them where to fall back to because they're withdrawing. Or retreating, I guess. And this is really the first somewhat major defeat we've suffered at the hand of the Confederates. But I think we'll be able to get the Army of Northeastern Virginia down to Richmond before uh, things get too desperate. Looks like our provision status is getting better. We're back up to 40%. So, you know, the Department of Northeastern Virginia got close enough to this depot... Uh, to start drawing good amounts of supplies. Meanwhile, in West Virginia, the Army of the Northwest, a Confederate force of about 17,000 soldiers, is pretty close to Pittsburgh and also some key rail lines here. So I have been mustering a force of about 11,000 troops under Major General McClellan, and I'm going to go ahead and send those guys east to try and dislodge the Army of the Northwest as well. Apparently my army is not happy. They don't like some of my commanders or something. I wish I knew which commanders were disliked. It doesn't really tell me that. Fame Rising Star. Does it, I mean, is it McClellan? Do they not like McClellan? We've got Ulysses S. Grant as a division commander. Samuel Heinzelman is a division commander. I'm not sure. Uh, meanwhile, we also have the Army of the Ohio, which has fallen back to uh, Chicoltith. Uh, the Army of the Tennessee of the Confederates sort of pushed it back. It's it's a pretty small army under Major General Don Carlos Buell. 
I should be raising more troops, but frankly, I don't have the money right now. It's still a little bit early in the war to be raising huge armies. Okay. So Patterson's at his destination. He's still suffering rear guard casualties. Hey, Patterson. How about instead of taking those casualties, you fall back to Fredericksburg? No? No. You're just going to keep slowly falling back? Okay. All right, let's increase the speed here. I'm going to keep withdrawing. Patterson's going to withdraw to the west, I guess. Which is fine, because that's generally where I want him eventually anyway. Meanwhile, the Confederates are back at Richmond. It looks like they are taking Richmond here pretty quickly. They're up to 64% capture of the city. Old Patterson back. Richmond's back in Confederate control, although some of the facilities around Richmond are not. And meanwhile, uh, in West Virginia, the battle that's going to happen first is the Department of the Ohio under Major General uh, McClellan here against uh, George A. Portfield, who I don't know who that is. I've never heard of that commander, but he's got 17,000 troops and 31 guns against our 11,000 troops and seven guns. I think those are good enough odds to fight, so let's jump in. The Battle of Wheeling, Virginia, August 11, 1861. After the initial skirmishing and maneuvering, the armies are deploying for battle. Major General George McClellan versus Major General Portfield. Okay. Let me get rid of that. Uh, it's actually going to say, I think it looks like 18,000 troops. Confederacy has better intel on us. Whoa. Do they really have 26,000 troops? Outnumbering us more than two to one? Is that is that true? There's no... Is my intelligence that bad? Holy shit. Well, that was not quite what I bargained for. Ugh. All right, where are my troops anyway? I guess, you know, we'll see what we can do. I've, I've won under difficult circumstances before. We're on the offensive in this battle, so maybe that'll let me pick a good position to attack them from. Um, this map seems fairly straightforward. I'm, the rebels have the southern... In eastern map portions, this map doesn't have a lot of potential positions where they could be sort of hung, you know, waiting at. I'm guessing they're either going to be in this town here or they'll be down in the southern edge of the map. Toward like Foggy Top or the hills down there. So, let's go ahead and get going here. We've got General Grant and General Heinzelman. I guess rather than issue orders to both of them, we can just have McClellan issue the orders. We only have one battery of artillery, which could pose a problem. Our infantry, Springfield rifled muskets, those are very good. Rifled muskets, Springfield muskets. So two of the three brigades under Grant have rifled muskets. And it looks like two of the brigades under... Right. So Grant has three brigades. Two of the three have rifled muskets. Meanwhile, one of the two brigades under the second division of Heinzelman have a rifled musket. And then we have 24-pound howitzers. So we've got three brigades, which will have probably a range advantage over the Confederates, which could allow us to skirmish against them pretty effectively and maybe kind of pepper them until, uh, until they're beat down a little bit. We're going to go ahead and just march down the main road toward Willow Garden. Um, we're going to take each of these objectives in turn. You can see we are the attacker in this particular battle. It is raining, heavy rain, lightning. These conditions, it'll be better to stay in camp. The roads and uh, fields turn into mud, slowing everyone down. A cunning general with crack troops may use these conditions to hide troop movements. The conditions are very bad for the men in the field, and the storm hinders visibility. Okay, well, I'm more worried about if there's wet powder preventing me from fighting, but doesn't sound like that's the case so we're going to move down toward will garden and then i think we'll just kind of 
Well, I'm not sure what we do from there. Because the Confederates have objectives on all three of these. I feel like the most logical place would be down here near Compton and Hartford where maybe they would be... Oh, wait, never mind. Let's slow things down. We've detected the enemy. They're deployed on Willow Hill. We can see there's two brigades of enemy troops. Ooh, and they are in trenches by the looks of it. There's also a detachment on the river here guarding their flank. So that is a pretty cunning position here for these boys to be in. So General Grant, you're going to halt your formation. You're going to form into single line and you're going to... No, just, just halt your men. And then we'll form up here. Meanwhile, General Heinzelman... I mean, the problem is with this weather, we're probably going to be suffering pretty bad fatigue penalties here. There also appears to be enemy artillery off here to the right. I usually like to fight at times two speed. Can you get your orders up here? I don't want Richard or Duval to march his brigade right into the enemy. When you issue orders, there is a delay between when they actually are acted upon. So you can see the rebels do have artillery over here to the east. So we're going to go ahead and deploy Grant up here, I think, in the woods. What's this? Feud own initiative. Okay, so apparently the commander of this brigade has a feud with the commander of the army as a whole. Which is inter an interesting mechanic in the game where basically troops can act on their own because they don't like their commanding general. Which, you know, sometimes, sometimes that would happen. Not so much acting on their own, but at least I don't want you in double line formation. Just single line. Form up here. Single line. We may wait till the next day. It is 8 a.m. Where are these guys going? What are you doing? Don't you do that. Don't be stupid. Don't march along the roadway like right into the enemy formation. God, don't be stupid. Stupid. Ugh. All right, single line formation for Heinzelman's division. So we'll form Heinzelman up on the roadway. I think my general, it looks like they ex their trenches extend down to the south. I wonder how far out to the east they extend. I'd like to try and pin the enemy front with Heinzelman's division, then use Grant's division and the two of their three brigades with long-range weapons to try and flank the enemy. But I don't know. This is, I got to say, this is the best chosen position of any AI army that I have seen so far. So it will be interesting to see how well they hold to their position or if they try and flank or do anything like that. Meanwhile, the enemy is hitting us with artillery, but we're not losing too badly, just 12 casualties so far. And then we're gonna move McClellan over here. My own artillery will probably be outclassed Grant's troops are probably going to be exhausted from marching cross-country in bad weather. Also, I think most of his... Oh, no, these aren't all... These aren't rookies. Actually, so Meade's brigade are rookies. But two of Grant's three brigades have been in combat before. And all of Heinzelman's brigades have been... And by the way, the way you know down here is this first icon here. So the red icons indicate negative effects on morale... Green icons represent positive effects on morale. All right, so let's move Grant a little bit further over. Maybe even get one of his brigades into the woods here. And we'll see if we can flank this enemy trench while we keep Heinzelman to pin them in the front. This is definitely a bold maneuver for someone like McClellan, who was not known for being super... Uh, Aggressive. If he had come across an enemy army that was almost three times his size, he would almost surely not have attacked. But hey, you know. Because I don't know for sure that they're three times our size. That's what the intelligence says. But we could be wrong. I think. 
I love these hand-drawn maps, by the way. They're freaking awesome. All right, don't, like, expose your flank to the enemy artillery there. That's... Uh, up to 18 casualties for Grant's division. I don't know if the 24-pounders can hit the enemy from here or not. Not, the elevation certainly favors the rebels. Now, the enemy has two brigades in reserve by the looks of it. So they've got at least three brigades in trenches, and then we can see two brigades to the rear. All right, we're going to switch these guys to long-range fire. We're going to switch me, or Grant's entire division to long-range fire. It will result in spending ammunition more freely but will also result in us being able to engage the enemy at, at longer ranges. Especially beneficial for our rifled musket units, which may outrange the enemy if they don't have an equivalent weapon. All right, I don't really want to attack these trenches head on, but I do think we'll skirmish with the 4th Brigade. We'll just see what the enemy has in store for us. So we'll advance these guys. Well, you know what we could actually do? We could also send some skirmishers out too. So we can go ahead and send a detachment out. Richardson's brigade. 200 skirmishers will send out against Pelham's brigade. Also go ahead and send some of the skirmishers out uh, from Andrew's, Andrew's brigade. They only have muskets though. We'll halt the rest of the brigade here so you can see these guys are engaging Pelham's brigade who are in trenches, but the skirmishers are doing some work. And actually, the main line is engaging now as well. So the enemy does appear either due to their their higher elevation or their um, weaponry. They can engage us. You can see they are volleying back here. They're firing at Andrew's detachment with their smoothbores who are suffering heavy casualties. So we'll go ahead and have them fall back can find the damn order. Apparently I can't. So they're just going to rout. <laughs> okay. Go back and join your brigade. Will you do that? Or are you just... Yeah, okay. So they went back and joined the brigade. They lost 34 casualties. Meanwhile, now that they're out of range, it looks like Richardson's detachments is able to fire at Pelham's brigade with ease. So you can see they're inflicting some casualties on the enemy. And now I'm going to go ahead and have the right flank unit here under Isaiah Duval. I'm going to go ahead and have them detach some skirmishers. Mainly because I don't know what's in front of me, and with this weather, I don't want to risk it. So we're going to send these guys through the woods, and then we're going to have Grant move his division to try and flank the enemy. So we'll put three brigades on this enemy trench line's flank. Israel Richardson has 2,300 troops with crack weapons. He is he's in good shape. Meanwhile, the skirmishers getting routed from Andrew's brigade was not, not confidence-inspiring. I love the sound of the musketry. I, I, the volume's probably a little bit low for you, but I just love that rippling sound of musketry. The sounds in this game are really good. So Duval's detachment has arrived on the enemy flank. As far as I can tell, there's no refused position here. There's no enemy troops that are are bent backwards, if you will, to protect the flank. So the courier is moving from McClellan to Grant. You can see him riding here. To bring the orders to advance his division. And General Grant will begin to do so. The Musket Brigade is under Colonel General, Colonel, not General, Colonel George G. Meade on Grant's right flank. Right, so there's a lot of enemy artillery here. I don't know who they're shooting at. I guess Grant? He's lost 44 men entirely to enemy artillery.
All right, skirmishers move this way. So go ahead and attack with Meade, Milroy, and Duval against this enemy entrenchment. Meanwhile, the one lead brigade with the good weapons here still firing away. You know, that's one one complaint is I feel like the AI should send Seems Brigades lost 150 men. Like they should send one of these non-entrenched brigades forward to try and shoo me off. Don't just sit there and eat fire. But hey, whatever. All right, so we've got a skirmishers in behind Slocum's brigade, and it looks like we outrange him as well. He must have crap weapons. So we're just pounding Slocum. Again, he's in trenches, so he's not losing too badly. We've fired multiple volleys here. Meade's brigade's lost 32 men. The Indiana brigade under Robert Milroy has lost no one. They fired, or three, three men. They fired off three volleys. And then the West Virginia Brigade under Duval, they've lost 15 men. Skirmishers are also in behind the enemy. And the enemy's just sitting there taking, taking fire, so... I will compliment the AI for picking a tremendous defensive position. I think this was a very well founded position, but they're way too passive in receiving our, our attack. Now, it does look like they've turned... Well, maybe not. I was going to say Bankhead's Brigade. It looks like it's turned to face my flanking maneuver, but they're marching the other direction. No sign of other enemy troops that might be a threat to us. Our own artillery blazing away here. But they're howitzers at the enemy. And we should be able to crush Slocum's Brigade and defeat him in detail. Up to 162 casualties now. Okay. Alright, I should probably link these skirmishers back up. I don't know how to do that. How do you rejoin? Alright, maybe I'll do this. We'll see if they rejoin. I think I'd rather those 200 muskets or so to join Richardson's brigade. Since he's not engaged with the enemy, there's no reason to, like, worry about distracting the enemy casualties. The enemy fire. And you'd have more, more fire if they rejoin. Skirmishers apparently only carry a portion of the ammo forward, which is interesting. Four volleys out of the West Virginia Brigade. Seven out of the Indiana Brigade. I might run out of ammo before we dislodge the entire enemy from their position, but anything we can do to inflict heavy losses on the enemy with minimal losses on our own self. We'll move McClellan again to be a little bit closer to the front. Commanders can be injured, though, so keep that in mind. So we've lost just shy of 100 men. The enemy considerably more. Slocum's Brigade, 347. Pelham's, 148 seems 262 but we need those kind of figures to defeat an enemy army more than twice our size also once these two brigades that are out in the open here shift again 3,000 troops just turn and face me and this flanking maneuver becomes a lot less viable but i'll just keep blazing away at slocum 400 casualties despite the entrenchments let's just kill us some rebs all right, we'll move up to times two speed. And artillery is fired off about, is it 15 rounds? I think they start with 60 rounds. Maybe not. We're firing the well, furthest left, I think, is solid shot. And then middle is case. And then right is canister, I think. Anyway. Richardson's brigade has used a fourth of their total ammo here. Yeah, ammunition's going to be an issue. Now, units do resupply, I believe, at the end of the day. I don't know if you can resupply ammo in the middle of a battle. But we may find out. What are you doing? What? 
I don't think I told the skirmishers to move up like that. Feud, own initiative. The commander of this unit, or higher hierarchy, acts on his own initiative without orders. <laughs> Fuck you! Richardson, what are you doing? You're gonna get your skirmishers killed. Well, they're now in range of the enemy muskets, it looks like, and they're shooting back. Richardson's low on ammo, it says. The skirmishers are. I'm not sure the 4th Brigade itself is. Slocum just sitting there. Come on, AI. You picked such a good defensive position, and you sabotaged it by not responding to a very clear threat to your flank. And instead, you consolidated two very good brigades, which could have completely responded. Like, if these two brigades had moved up here, positioned themselves in line here, it would have been a frontal assault across largely open ground with the enemy having a numerical advantage. Oh, that would have been the smart thing to do. And they would have had the other guys in trenches. But they didn't do that. Um. Okay, these guys, are they set to long? No, they're set to medium range. No wonder. Six Brigade, get back in action. I'm going to send them up towards Slocum's Brigade, who's now lost almost a thousand men. They've got to be close to breaking. Well, actually, we'll wait until we break the enemy flank. Then we'll support them on rolling up the enemy position and moving toward Pelham. But hey, at least we're, we're firing a fair number of volleys. Most of the time, I feel like my battles end after two or three volleys. It's kind of like the movie The Patriot, where it's like, I need you to fire two volleys and then run. It's like, well... Move meet up. If you want to move your commander without ordering the entire formation under his command uh, to form at that position, you use the Alt key on your keyboard and then right select. All right, so the enemy has been broken here. Slocum's brigade is now running. So we're going to form up on Pelham's flank now. We'll issue the orders one at a time. We don't have to do that, but we will. Would have liked to keep firing on them and inflict more casualties, but... Meanwhile, my own skirmishers... The nice thing is, at least in Richardson's case, the skirmishers don't lose too many men because they're skirmishers, so they're, they're broken out a little bit more. But you can see his skirmishers broke and then returned to his unit. The problem is that damages the morale of the entire unit. So the enemy is turning Pelham's brigade to meet my assault. So they're abandoning their entrenchments. So that is actually smart. So good job there, AI. Smart, smart decision. So I'm assuming this is going to be a lot bloodier now. The good thing for Meade in his case is the enemy's already lost over almost 300 men. So... Also, now that they've turned to expose their flank, I'm going to order the 6th Brigade to move up under Timothy Andrews to add their 1,400 muskets to the assault and fire into the enemy flank. They're out of their entrenchments, I believe. Well, it still has a in cover. Come on, man. Move up. Move Duvall's detachment to cover the flank. And then the West Virginia Brigade should be able to hit the enemy here. Okay, there's the rest of the enemy army. Or at least another big chunk of it. Some of them are in the open. Duvall's detachment's firing some skirmishing ranging shots on Bankhead's Brigade, which for whatever reason is withdrawing. It's almost noon. Why are they not firing? I could have so sworn I saw them fire a volley. There we go. It says the enemy's in cover, but anyway. 
So Pelham is now up to 500 casualties and he's being hit on each flank from fire as well as from his front. So I don't think he will survive long. Although the six does look like they're taking some fire. All right, mean you gotta, or Grant, you gotta get closer to your men. So you can issue orders more qu quickly. Artillery's blasting through its ammo also. Now this battle is occurring in a position where we don't have a depot or anything like that, so supply may end up being a little bit of a challenge for us. At least in terms of, like, resupply or provisions after the battle. Because we're moving away from our depots. Man, the, a lot of these commanders have feuds with the commanding generals, so they kind of operate on their own initiative, which is kind of interesting. I like that mechanic. There were definitely generals who did not get along with their commanders, and it would, from time to time, have a material impact on the battle. So we've got... Grant's division is blazing away. Grant better become a hero after this battle. His troops are doing the lion's share of the work. Meanwhile, it looks like Pelham's brigade is going to break. Just shy of a thousand casualties. You can see they're out... Well, it just says they're outflanked. It doesn't say they're retreating yet. But now they have a thousand casualties. So now it looks like they're trying to move back into the trenches. Richardson's brigade's down under 20 rounds. We may have to just, like, halt in place and wait for wait for the night, wait, like, eight hours. Keep firing into them, boys. Pour it into them, lads. Do you not shoot at retreating men? Well, that's sporting of you, I guess. All right, so continue the flanking maneuver. Meade, move your boys forward. You two, Milroy. And Duval. Shift these skirmishers over a little bit. So that's two enemy brigades routed with over a thousand casualties each. Se seems detachment here. Fire into some of their artillery from the rear with skirmishers, I think. Richardson's down to 15 rounds. 52 still for Timothy, but he's got the muskets, so he doesn't have great range. Um, looks like the enemy's abandoned some guns. Oh, did I just order them to charge? No, didn't. So everybody's getting low on ammo. But I did just order them, so we did capture. Meade's brigade did capture. What did they capture? It says Springfield muskets. That's not what they captured. This is an artillery detachment. Oh, no, they're moving forward to take the guns over here. Well, that's dumb. You're going to get yourself shot up. Boys, there's a brigade right there formed up to your front. Maybe you should exercise some prudence and wait for them to be driven off. But anyway... We're just rolling them up like a wet blanket. It's like second Manassas all over again. Or I guess more accurately, maybe Chancellorsville. Except that it's raining. Okay. Milroy still has a good amount of ammo. 37 rounds. 37 for Duval. Need is at 26. So most of Grant's division actually still has some ammo. Richardson's brigade is, is about to be out of the fight. Now, in games like Scourge of War, you have supply wagons that can bring additional supply for it. I don't see that as an option during the day. Oh, shit. Meade's detachment has suffered significant casualties, and the men are anxious. Oh, okay, so his artillery detachment basically got themselves shot to pieces. Meade's up to 200 casualties now. All right, let's move our, our... Well, if our artillery can keep firing, I guess, we'll just let them do that. Grant's command has lost 270 casualties. Of those, almost 250 of them are from Meade's brigade. 
Meanwhile, we've driven back Sem Sem Sem's brigade. Another thousand enemy casualties. Seems like the enemy pretty much breaks once they lose about a thousand men. These are largely green troops. They have some experience, but not a ton. And it is now about one o'clock. So there's enemy detachments here. I'm curious why they have artillery icons, unless they've already abandoned their guns. All skirmishers are moving up. They're down to six rounds of ammunition. I'm curious what happens when a unit runs out of ammo in this game. I've never seen that happen because battles rarely last this long. At least in the uh, campaign. They have tactical battles that are like historical tactical battles. Those tend to last a bit longer. Alright, so we're low on ammo for our howitzers. Let's... Maybe we should bring those guns up. I just feel like if they're still in range, they should keep firing now because by the time they come up, the enemy may, may have broken completely. Okay. George G. Meade, keep pressing on, lads. Keep pressing on. All right, those three detachments. The enemy is retreating. Okay, so the enemy army is retreating. Now, we only have four minutes to pursue. I'm guessing that's because the enemy still controls much of the battlefield. But it looks like the enemy is going to retreat. So we're just going to order everybody to push forward here and inflict as many casualties as they can in the next few minutes. Because some of these enemy brigades didn't even really engage. Just a really passive enemy army. They picked a good defensive position. I, I can't stress that enough. I'm impressed compared to what I usually see in, in some, in, at least in the past when the game was earlier in its development. I didn't typically see the enemy AI pick such strong positions. It picked a strong one. Its flank was open, but that's fine. That happened in the war. But what they didn't do was they didn't respond with their mobile forces who weren't in the entrenchment to the threat. In the past, they have. In the past, when you outflank an enemy, they would respond in battles that I faced, but usually it responded in a way where it would like retreat rather than refuse its flank. And I believe they're supposed to refuse their lines now. Looks like the enemy lost all 50 of their cannons. They abandoned them. Meanwhile, they lost about 3,600 infantry to our 472. So a pretty decisive victory from a casualty count perspective. The enemy army still is probably in reasonably good shape. And I would expect they actually have more brigades, more troops and units that didn't even engage us. Um, so they probably could fight us pretty effectively again. But I'll take that victory. Those, those, those ratios are good. The Battle of Wheeling ended on August 11th, 1861, with a federal minor victory. Every damn battle's a minor victory now. Enemy national morale falls almost by a percent. Our experience rises by over a full percent. And I, I don't know if that's influenced by how many volleys or how long they're engaged or, or what the factors are that drive that. Let's see what McClellan's battlefield report is. Also, because everything's a minor victory, it always says it's like a narrow victory, which is, I don't know. Colonel Pelham loses face. Support for the rebel cause wavers. The Battle of Wheeling has ended with the Army of Northwest, the Northwest retreating in panic. My command has earned us a total victory with the enemy army running for their lives. The enemy has reportedly suffered a total of 3,949 casualties. Yeah, actually, that's what it said. And uh, there are 535 killed. Their morale is believed to be stable. We lost 472, 118 killed, 74 missing. We've captured 1,800 rifles and 15 guns from the battlefield. Well, yeah. All right, so we took wheeling previously, but we'll presumably take it again. It may be, again, difficult to keep us supplied there. The weather's bad, and I guess my, my troops are still unhappy. Which I don't quite understand, but we'll pursue a little bit. All right. So it doesn't look like the enemy had any rear guard action. They just flat out retreated. Meanwhile, my own troops are in the process of taking wheeling. So that's a nice little victory. Nice little feather in our cap. If we go to the army, let's actually click on McClellan's troops. And we take a look at General McClellan. His own fame is now legendary. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, General Grant, who has now won his first victory as a commander. 
What's his? He was a rising star before. Now he is legendary. Heinzelman's first battle. He is a rising star. Duvall. I mean, a lot. Of, so Duvall now has one star, so he's gaining experience. They were greenhorn, so like you can see, Grant has no stars here, which means he's a greenhorn in terms of his experience level. Whereas Duvall is now inexperienced with one star. He's seen some combat, but too inexperienced in his current current assignment to effectively lead his men in battle. Milroy and Mead all have one star. Andrews Richardson also has one star. I don't know if commanders of divisions or corps or armies gain experience. I'm not sure. Because McClellan's fought as many battles as most of the troops here now, I think. Because he's that's his second full-fledged victory. Anyway. British intervention is not likely. Confederates aren't invading anywhere. Okay. Meanwhile, if we move to the east, Richmond has been retaken by the Confederates. Have they retaken the Treasure Ironworks? They have. But we've got McDowell on the way in. His readiness is almost good. Readiness is currently probably mediocre, right? Yeah, but he's just shy of being green. Uh, meanwhile, provisions are up to 48%, so gaining provisions... But he'll be in here soon, probably in the next day. All right, so we're going to pause that here, and we're at about almost 40 minutes now. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up here. We had a victory for McClellan in the West against the Army of the Northwest. They lost over 3,600 troops. They've now lost a total of about 4,000 troops. And the enemy strength is down to 17,000, if that intelligence is accurate. I guess that makes sense if they were at 22,000. It was weird. The battle started out and said 28,000, but then when I looked mid-battle, it said 22,000. So some fog of war, presumably, there. Uh, we're taking Wheeling. We'll take that in a day or two. How the hell did they take these depots back here? It says they took the coal mine. It says they took Steubenville, which is a key junction here along the railway to the west of Pittsburgh, I guess. Rails can go north. But losing that depot to the Confederacy, and or did they have raiders out that way? I didn't see any enemy armies out that way. We'll have to send a detachment up there to take that stuff back, especially the coal mines. I don't want them getting coal from Union territories. Athens, Georgia, or not Georgia, Athens, uh, Ohio is in Confederate hands too. That makes sense, at least. The Army of the Tennessee was out in that portion of... Uh, portion of Tennessee yes yeah, so we could always send Buell up that way no sign of other enemy troops in Kentucky they did take the southwestern portion of the state I haven't sent anyone in there because I don't have the troops right now to do it And Missouri is almost entirely Union. There's a couple of towns, and I think western Missouri is still under Confederate control. But generally speaking, that's going well. So, we're about to fight a second battle of Richmond. Why is Hampton's division all the way back here? 20,000 men going to be in Hampton's division. I wish, and this is something that I know is on the roadmap, is for another enhancement to the campaign AI... I really wish they would know how to manage their armies better. Like this army of the Shenandoah shouldn't still just be like the army of the Shenandoah and the army of the Potomac should either have merged or these 6,000 men in the army of the Potomac should have joined the militia over here. Like AI army management is weird. It seems like they raise troops and they equip them, but they don't, I've never seen them merge. Maybe they will eventually, but so far they haven't. Uh, if we go to the strategy page, morale of the army 73 to 65 in our favor, 92 national versus 91 for them, 96 to 72 for national morale, so we've got a pretty big national morale advantage. The enemy almost has 100,000 troops fielded. We only have 65,000 because I'm freaking out about my damn money. Our income is in really bad shape. Our finances, just abysmal. Negative 37 million this month. 
We're not really recruit recruiting a lot of troops. Unemployment's 10%. Interest rate's almost 10%. Credit rating triple B. That's bad. You know, where are we at with policies? We're still a ways away. 21 days from industrialization and breadbasket. We'll get two policies at once. But yeah, that's going to do it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts below. And that'll do it for another episode of Grand Tactician, the Civil War, our Union Let's Play series. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching, and I'm out.